Good morning to everyone. I again welcome you to this session on novel approaches to water in FAO. And uh, I really welcome my colleagues and my guests to this session. As we all know, the importance of water resources for development is largely acknowledged, but still there is a large scope for integration, coordination, and effective planning to help enhancing food security for all. Really, the definition of coherent approaches for sustainable water management in agriculture that looks into interconnected social, economic, and the environment remains crucial. As recently reiterated by our FAO Director General, integrated water resource management is a global priority. In this session, we would like to look together with you into our novel approaches to water, FAO novel approaches to water, starting with a keynote presentation by our division director, the Land and Water Division, Mr. Li Feng Li, giving us an overview of these novel approaches. Mr. Li, please. Good morning, thank you very much, uh, Mahar. Good morning, colleagues. As uh, Mahar shared, I think the intention of this session is really try to share with you some of the new thinking, some of the new ideas, and uh, some of the new initiatives. We call it a new FAO journey or FAO new water journey. And uh, I will start with a few background slides and then really try, try to you know, put up those ideas, initiatives to invite your thought, and also invite you know, the partners to work with us in the years to come. I think for us to work in the water community, everyone understands this. You know, water is such an important natural resource that makes this, you know, uh, the planet very unique and uh, from the social, from the environment, from economic, from all the different perspectives. And uh, the fundamental roles that the water plays to support lives, it's well understood, I think, by this audience. However, it may not be the truth for the different audience, even within FAO. For me, it's for, us, it's so, for us to work on the water issues, it's so easier to understand Water is food, food is water. But I found out, or many of us have found out, that has been took for granted. In fact, in FAO, we don't have many major, major, you know, large initiatives try to prioritize water in, at the organization level. Yes, we do lots of projects. But at the organization level, we are so much behind to say how agriculture sector can better address the water challenge together to meet both the water, water need for agriculture, but also the other societal needs. And on top of that, we already faced the impact of climate change. Last year is an extraordinary year. That's many places include Europe, include many other major continents facing unprecedented drought. The drought in Europe last year, it's a 500 years, 500 years of frequency. On the other side, we see a number of the floods also happening on this continent, Madagascar, South Africa, Pakistan. So we feel the, the impact, and certainly, according to IPCC report, so on the right, there's the three major maps showing regarding the water-related disaster, the perception intensity. The last one is the disaster, that's the drought happened. And clearly we see the increase in the past decades. If we look at into the future, 
no matter what scenarios we are using, no matter whether we use the scenario of 1.5 degrees increase or 2. degrees or 4. degrees, and all these scenarios, certainly we're going to face much, much more drought and what is scarcity in the future. And everybody knows to achieve 1.5 degree is already very, very challenging. If it's beyond 1.5 degree, the situation will be much, much worse than this, meaning that we were receiving, we were facing much, much more drought, much, much severe water scarcity in the future. So we really have a very short window opportunity. And the scientists already concluded, you know, if the temperature in the future cannot be maintained within like a two degrees scenario or 1.5 degree scenario, then our capacity to adapt to the future climate change probably it's, it's very limited. Or in other words, we probably will not be able to adapt to the future climate change. And agriculture is already one of the largest sector users, accounting for more than 70% of the human freshwater withdrawal. And that's also contributed to water scarcity challenge in many rare basins. Basically on this map, the redder, the worse. On the other side, agriculture sector is also the sector that has suffered from climate change, that has suffered from the, the global global temperature increasing because with the more carbon put it into the air, basically the global climate systems have much more energy. That means it's become an uncertain scenario in the future. And if you look at the demand for agricultural products, according to our uh, uh, forecast, by 2050, and basically, we need to produce at least 50% of more of food, fiber, biofuels, and feed to meet the demands of the human development. And under different scenarios, for example, if you look at the business at the euro, basically maintain the current level of what is use efficiency. And then if we consider climate change, we at least need additionally 29% of fresh water. Even neglect about the climate change, we still need 17%. If we try to improve the, the water use efficiency, and then we call it a sustainable, sustainable model, we still need at least 50% more fresh water to produce 50% more food, fiber, biofuels, and feed to meet the, the demand by 2050. So it's challenging. It's challenging then within FU, we started to look at such a big picture and uh, through triggered by, certainly by the drought, by the floods happened last year, but also bearing in mind all this forecast and all the increasing demand and we also look at how we at the division, in the land and water division, could be able to address those issues through our strategic planning process to see what we need to do more and what we need to, to do better. And considering that, then in October, uh, late October last year, we organized a technical briefing uh, for all the members to understand, to bring them onto the same thinking journey to look at the big picture, to look at the increasing demand, look at the drivers to the agriculture and water, and then come up with the source of solutions that's how FAO can work with all the member countries in the future. Followed, uh, followed that technical, technical briefing in late November, we organized Rome Water Dialogue, and thanks to many of the audience sitting here contributed to that Rome Water Dialogue, then really to present some of the thinking and some of the solutions that FVU could start to uh, implement. And all this thinking was also submitted to the FAO governing bodies of the program committee, finance committee, and also the, the council in December. Through those FAO decision-making bodies, and clearly now water 
is become FAO's top priority. That's why we call it a new FAO water journey. And along that journey, we have a number of programmatic initiatives that we want to design, develop, and implement it together with the partners, with the member countries. So that's include, for example, even FAO, we have the most comprehensive and sophisticated statistical information systems. We also have the Aquastat, the most you know, advanced water data set. However, we don't have the information system that look at the crop level, what kinds of requirement for the crops to be more pro productive, what kinds of soil, land, and water information, uh, land, uh, those resources are needed for the crops. So we started to develop a new in initiative called SolarWise. Basically, at any single crop level, we want to know the soil, land, and, and water requirement for those crops. And this is already built of existing works on the eco, on the aqua, on the aqua crop, and also built upon the soil information systems that we have already. So we're aiming to have this system in two, three to five years. At the global level, for any given major crop, we can immediately know where those crops are planted. What's the growth status? and how much yield we can forecast. And we can also use the remote sensing information to say, look, to achieve much better production, what kinds of soil land management practice need to be implemented? That is one of the initiatives. The second one we call OSIM. It's an initiative really to focus on water scarcity, addressing the water scarcity for agriculture and environment and build upon some of the thinking, some of the works of the WASAC, and really look at, you know, from the crop, from the water scarcity perspective, you know, how we can address the water scarcity challenge. And certainly we build upon the aqua, aqua start, then look at how we can strengthen the aqua start, but also use the remote sensing and the GIS you know, technologies we already have the WAPA, the Water Productivity uh, Initiative, that uses the remote sensing data, then put them into the GIS system, then be able to understand the, the soil, the land information for, for the crops, then be able to advise the farmers in terms of irrigation practice. And those information could be, have been built into the apps. So farmers can check the app, understand if they need more water for their crops, to understand where those, whether the water required is available to them, and then for them to make a decision regarding when to irrigate and how much water is needed. Certainly, to address the water scarcity challenge, irrigation is a part of the solution. However, if you look at the global investment on irrigation, it's stacked since about 2010. The major global international financial institutions stopped major investment in irrigations. However, as I said, like a drought in Europe this year, it's 500 years of frequency. The current ring-fed agriculture probably will not be able to be addressed to cope with the incoming climate change in the future. So we really need to look at the irrigation need, but also the irrigation potentials from a new climate perspective. So we will run, we will launch a global uh, irrigation need and a potential mapping, started with the pilot in six countries, and then learn from that pilot, then roll out to a global coverage. And through that mapping, we hope that we can provide a very uh, comprehensive, but also at the first hand information to the invest, to the you know, IFIs, to the government, to support them to make a conscious decision regarding the irrigation need in the future. And certainly, 
we will have to look at the continuum of the irrigation from the big irrigation schemes to the supplementary irrigation arrangement to the rain fed agriculture in the future. Probably also heard that FAO uh, last year, we also uh, endorsed by all the members a climate change strategy. And this is for the first time that at the corporate level, FAO has the climate change strategy. And to implement that strategy, the core part is really about land, soil, and water. I always say water is the other side of the coin in terms of climate change. On the one side, sure, it's a temperature. But we feel the climate change impact must much, much more from the water perspective. So our FAO's action plan on climate change will really be centered around water, and we are developing an action plan uh, at the corporate level. And certainly, we will also need to address the water quality and the pollution issues. On the one side, agriculture is one of the largest polluter in many countries. And the pollution load from agriculture already you know, overtaking the industries. Huh? On the other side, agriculture also suffered from a poor water quality, from pollution. And the sector cannot produce the safe food so we have to find a way to address water quality challenge. And this is a new initiative that we work with other divisions that focus on crop production, but also on livestock production. Um, also, we, from the last year, FAO also proposed the idea to support all the countries to develop a national water roadmap. And this was the idea that came into my mind back at the, in March in Senegal during the World Water Forum. Realizing that March this year, we have the Watershed Moment UN 2023 Water Conference after 47 years. Realizing that water is, as I said, is the key natural resources to support the delivery of all the SDGs. And you name it, among all the 17 SDGs, none of them will be delivered without the water. So we will have to bring the water into the broader SDG agenda, sure, achieve SDG 6, but also collectively to achieve SDG 6 together with SDG 1, SDG 2, SDG 12, 13, 15, etc., etc. But to do so, we will have to learn from other sectors. One of the key delivery mechanisms is really at the national level. How can we make sure that the water is so well understood by the national government? And how the national government can really pull together all the different initiatives from different sectors to make sure that the water will be comprehensively used, sustainably used? Because very often we see, okay, at the national level, you know, we have one sector planning, even from agriculture sector. We also noticed that in the 2021, through the UN Food System Summit, 116 countries developed their pathway towards food security. And my colleagues, Natalie and a group of the young scientists in the ASL, they read through all the food pathways, and then they identified that only one third of those food pathways really meaningfully mention about how water will have to achieve that. So the majority of the food pathways basically neglect water completely. So bear in mind that, and we propose that we work at the national level, work with the national government, and really to strengthen their water planning, their water planning to achieve all the SDGs. As a part of that, we also received the guidance from FAO Council that we need to seriously look at the water tenure issues. Because in many countries, in the absence of, of the water tenure, the decision-making is hard. Because we don't know how much water is available, uh, who is going to use how much water at what time. So water tenure is the key part of the effective water governance. And we're going to learn from our existing initiatives, from the existing pilot, and we're going to launch a global dialogue on water tenure. 
help the water planners, help the decision makers in the water sector to understand the, the, the tenure management and then how to use tenure to manage these precious resources. We already saw the tenure become one of the major governance tools for fisheries, for forest. So this is really a learning from the other sectors, then to use the water tenure to strengthen the governance systems in the future. Last but not least, all these initiatives is key component that's contributed to RWRM. For us in the water community, we know this by heart. RWRM you know, has been implemented at least discussing the water community 20 years. But it's not a term that has been fully endorsed, adopted in the FAO system. In the FAO system, in the decision-making bodies, this is not a standard term that's in the FAO governing bodies it's, it's being used. So hopefully through all these initiatives, we will contribute to the RWIM at the global, regional, and national levels. I think that is my presentation, and specifically on water, national water roadmap. We want to really encourage countries to set up a, you know, a, a participatory process to engage with the stakeholders at the national level, potentially through water dialogue, and then be able to come out with their vision, with their you know, objectives regarding what they want to achieve at the national level. And we propose this framework, and we will continue to share this you know, framework with countries, with the partners, and also organize some technical workshops to promote it. And uh, before the New York, we will also organize a regional workshop for the Africa country, and that will be organized in two weeks' time in uh, Haraya, in Zimbabwe. And uh, certainly we hope to you know, provide those technical and financial resources available to the countries who want to develop their national water roadmap. And hopefully, in New, in New York, we could have heard a number of the countries, their commitment, their progress regarding the National Water Roadmap, and then continue to follow up on that. And in New York, we also potentially will organize a dedicated side event uh, to share the thinking around the National Water Roadmap and uh, to gain much more support from other uh, agencies and partners. I think that's my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Li Feng, for this overview. And to dialogue with colleagues, I would prefer to go there, so I see you all, so I change. Thanks again. Let's see first the comments, the view of the insiders. Let's see the view of my colleagues. And here I invite three of my colleagues, Ms. Patricia Migueas, a technical officer at the Land and Water Division on the role of monitoring and data. Mr. Eugene Urarangwa from the field, from the regional office uh, uh, in, 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 in Africa. And my colleague, of course, you know all, Jean Barotto, Senior Officer from the Land and Water Division. Let me start with Patricia. Patricia, data and monitoring of water, we know all how it has a, a crucial role for the success of what is presented by the director of the new water journey in FAO. Also, FAO is advancing with digitalization very much. So how would you make the connection? How would you see data and monitoring contributing to this successful journey? For the question, um, yeah, let me say that um, data and information um, has been since FAO's foundation, one of the core functions of, of FAO. And, and indeed, it's in 
uh, is this, this mandate of data collection and analysis and dissemination of data is reflected in, in the Article 1 of, of FAO Constitution. So FAO has a um, lot of experience collecting data and, and information and, and disseminating the information at global level. And in the water sector, um, we have been um, working on this area um, for so many years. Um, so I think this is uh, part of the FAO's mandate because FAO members understand that um, data and information is key to, to make decisions, um, to design investment programs and, and policies uh, to, to address the challenges of water. And um, FAO works mainly on, on three major areas related to, to data and information. The first area is data collection and dissemination. Um, the second area is uh, the development of methods and methodologies and standards. And the third area is provide support to countries uh, through capacity development and workshops and, and trainings. Um, so, in the first area of um, data dissemination and, and, and collection, um, the director Lee mentioned already um, Aquastat, which is the FAO's global information system on, on water and agriculture. And every year through Aquastat, we collect and we update uh, data related to water uses and irrigated area and water availability. Uh, for around 80 countries, and, and we disseminate this data through through Aquastat platform. Um, another important role of of FAO in in water data is that we are custodian agency for two important indicators: uh, 641 on the water use efficiency and 642 on water stress. And we are the custodian agencies of these two indicators because, um, uh, as you know, agriculture is the major use, user by far of, of water. So the agricultural sector has much to say on how to address these issues of water use efficiency and, and water stress. So through our mandate of uh, custodian agency, we prepare global reports and we bring the message and, and we bring um, where are the hot areas where, where the international community has to work through the international forums like the high level political forum or the UN uh, conference that is taking place in, in March next year. This is related to the statistical uh, information but also as Director Lee mentioned, we, we, we work with uh, new innovative methods, um, so we, we also develop tools um, using um, remote sensing data. So one example is um, Vapor, which is an open source uh, platform which provides information near real-time data um, on, on water productivity. And we are very excited about uh, this um, vapor uh, project because um, thanks to the generosity of the government of the Netherlands, uh, we are going to launch the third phase of this platform and we will have information for, for all, all regions and countries. So far we have information for Africa and the Middle East, but um, in this uh, third phase we will cover um, the whole world. Um, and then um, I say that we work also on, on methodologies and, and, and standards. So one example of this work is uh, together with the International Water Management Institute, we are working on uh, development, development, uh, developing a, a methodology to assess the environmental flow requirements. Um, so we should not forget that the environment is also an important user of water and, and it's important for the countries to have a clear idea what are the, the needs of the, of the environment so um, we can ensure the, sustain, the sustainability of other uses, also agriculture. 
Um, we are also working on, on gender and data. Gender is very high in the political agenda, uh, but without uh, sex disaggregated data, um, we cannot um, uh, establish the, the right policies. So we are also working on, on with countries to raise awareness on the importance to have gender disaggregated data. Um, and finally, uh, another important area of work is uh, capacity development. So we uh, regularly um, have trainings and, and, and workshops with countries uh, to improve their water information systems, to use also not only statistical data, but also remote sensing data or geographical information systems. Um, and I have, to, I have to say that thanks to the to this uh, forum, we are going to start to work with the government of Cape Verde in improving um, the data collection and also the reporting on these two indicators that I mentioned, the water use efficiency and, and the water stress. Um, so I think that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Much, Patricia. Thanks for connecting the dots when it comes to water monitoring and data towards the journey, the new journey of water and FAO. Now let's go to the field. I have here my colleague Eugene Rurangwa from uh, RAF, from original office in Africa. Eugene, we heard the overview of the global perspectives, but how you see that reflected in the field? In other words, how you see FAO's normative work reflected in the field, so such a journey becomes successful. Thank you, thank you, Maher. At field level, where we are working with uh, farmers and the pastoralists, what they see at field level, that's what also ourselves as uh, FAO staff see. What do we see? Uh, for example, when I am in uh, West Africa or in the Sahel, I see an environment where we have almost two to three months of rain, and the other month, nothing. So, as FAO staff, as FAO in general, what can we do to, to, to support uh, farmers to, uh, you know, to produce and uh, to make sure that they have food and nutrition security all over the year with three months maximum of rain, which is really something that is tough. So, uh, Following the, 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 the program, the, 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 the corporate program of FAO, what we do uh, at field level is to try to make sure we support farmers to access water from the rain this few quantity of rain that is coming from groundwater. And th th those are mainly the, the, the three uh, sources of water that uh, we, we, we are using. Now there is the, the, the other source now using uh, 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 waste, uh, treated wastewater, but mainly to support using rainwater how to do it, it's just to capture that rain, capturing rain. Two methods of capturing it, using a, a system. Uh, we have a program that we call one million systems in the Sahel, and we have already uh, built more than 300 systems. There are two types types of systems, they are small systems of, of 15 to 20 uh, cubic meters for uh, 
household using, uh, and uh, we have also bigger uh, system uh, of uh, 50 cubic meters that we are using for for irrigation. We are also using uh, uh, the, 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 the method of uh, capturing uh, runoff, improving uh, local methods uh, in West Africa that they call bully. And this method, uh, you know it, uh, <laughs> Mahera, you know that you know it, it, it really uh, capture a lot of quantity of water from 15 uh, cubic meter to 18, e even more. And this water is really uh, helping for irrigation, even for domestic use, but more importantly, for pastoralists that needs water. It's really very important. And uh, above that, uh, that also we try to, to check if th that water is safe for, for using in agriculture and for also uh, livestock watering. This is very important. The other source actually is the groundwater, which is not yet very well uh, used in West Africa and the Sahel. We have a big quantity of water there, but we are now using uh, uh, groundwater uh, pumping water using, uh, uh, using uh, uh, solar pump. So uh, the, 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 the solar powered irrigation system is now developed in, in, in West Africa mainly, but also in Southern Africa, or almost in, in the dry lands areas in, Af in Africa. This is a technology that really is giving a, a lot of hope uh, because uh, uh, farmers they can they can they can cultivate all along the year without uh, you know uh, relying on on uh, on, uh, on on rain only and uh, this is important and from there we teach them the the appropriate method of production using uh, uh, really very good uh, seeds uh, uh, to 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 be able to produce more with with less. So uh, practically those uh, are, are things that we are, we are trying to teach them also to, uh, from, from colleagues from Rome, actually we are also uh, uh, giving them technical, uh, technical pamphlet to make sure that they, they follow up uh, very properly techniques that has to be, to be used. Apart from there, of course, uh, because of uh, the the, 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 the fact that uh, when it rains, we have the, 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 the issue of erosion, issue of uh, flooding. You know, the, 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 the flooding you are talking about mainly in our dry land re region, it came from really the, 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 the compaction of soil. When you have had only two, three uh, seasons of rain and the other, other months, the, 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 the soil is just uh, there. The, the, there is a compaction, and when the rain came back, there is really a big runoff, and, and it caused a, a flood. We, we are also uh, involved in, 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 a, in supporting communities in other uh, local methods to, 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 to just uh, protect the soil, the, the soil and water conservation methods, local methods like uh, Half Moon or Zai, you have heard about that, that help actually to, to, to stabilize soil, but at the same time also to improve uh, soil, uh, uh, soil humidity. So those are techniques that we are trying to, 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 to teach our farmers and the pastoralists. And, and it brings uh, really fruit, mainly it helps also to solve the issue of conflict. You know, we have conflict in those regions, and generally conflicts came from the lack of, uh, of uh, proper use of resource, of lack of resource as such. But when you bring water to communities, when you help them to, to improve uh, uh, their soil at farm level, they are stabilized and, uh, and they, 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 they have something to do, uh, mainly young people and the women. Thank you, Mahel.
Thanks very much, Eugene. Indeed, the examples you've given in terms of, let's say, the systems, the techniques at on-farm level, driven by local knowledge, also the, 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 the innovative ones in terms of the application of solar energy, from connecting with the, uh, uh, let's say, the new, new water in FAO, this where we see also what presented by the director as an initiative, the awesome water management one. Here we see where the normative work really, truly connects. Thanks so much, Eugene. Let me turn to our, to our last but, but close friend and colleague. You know, Jean, Jean, I will look into WASAC, but I connect with FAO. So let me ask you these questions. We are all, we are all here at a WASAC forum. And we just presented through the presentation of the director our new water. That water scarcity is at its core, but water scarcity is also at the core of WASAC. WASAC goes beyond FAO. FAO is a member of WASAC. So how this relationship can be harmonized, that what we present as novel approaches, what we present as a new FAO, find their ways to success through this partnership. I know it complicated your life, but yeah. let's see. <laughs> Thank you, Maher. I think first I'd like to congratulate uh, the partners of WASAG. Uh, when we were here four years ago, uh, we were still really being born. Now, if I look in this room, I see Kate was flown all the way from the Netherlands, and uh, we, we are supposed to launch uh, a publication that was produced by Kate and the other colleagues from the Sal and Agriculture Working Group on uh, a farmer's guidelines on Sal and Agriculture. Uh, yesterday, we had a workshop on uh, guidelines on pressurized irrigation that uh, was born from here. So the Italian chapter of WASAG decided Having seen actually Capo Verde and the challenges of Capo Verde, they decided to develop these guidelines to assist not only Capo Verde, but also other countries. So in fact, so much uh, that it was interesting that uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Miguel Damura, who was sitting here, requested the Italians to run a training specific to the Capo Verdeans. And when we workshop these guidelines uh, a few weeks back, uh, in, with the Working Group on Sustainable Agriculture Water Use, the African Union took part in that meeting and they also requested that the same guidelines are uh, also presented uh, to the colleagues uh, from uh, the African Union countries. Uh, at the end of this session, we will launch uh, a WASAC framework on financing mechanism. Uh, this framework helps us to access uh, finances that are not otherwise accessible through traditional means. These three products that I'm mentioning are your work as partners. But we cannot say that it stops there. It is one step towards addressing water scarcity in agriculture. And it has to continue. And tomorrow in the meetings of partner, we'll revisit ourselves and see, are we doing the right thing? How can we improve? Now, from FAO perspective, uh, first WASA was launched in acknowledgement that we alone cannot do it all. And it's proving to be correct. Now, but does it stop there? I don't think so. In FAO, we have several initiatives that keep on propping, and we need to harmonize, we need to harvest them so that we can maximize the synergies. So, awesome, uh, this uh, addressing water scarcity uh, in agriculture and environment, uh, it's uh, a, what we call a value-adding impact area. Uh, that is linked to one of the four betas of our strategic framework, beta environment. And the E at the end of awesome is important. It's about the environment. So it is a program that will be developed over the next period of 10 years. Uh, we started now with three activities, and you will understand their relevance. The first one is somehow a low-hanging fruit on drought resilience and nutritious crops. By the end of 2023, we aim to submit to our management and to our partners four proposals, having consultants with countries uh, to 
develop drought resilient and nutritious crops. Uh, that the work is going on already. Uh, you might be aware that within FAO in uh, the northeast uh, area, in uh, uh, the Arani region, we have a water scarcity initiative. Uh, that's quite a big initiative, and we need to establish synergies so that we can, in fact, have a greater impact. We have a similar initiative that is also starting in Southeast America, in, South, in, in, uh, in Asia. And uh, we will establish synergies with those three uh, through the interregional uh, technical platform on water scarcity in agriculture. Thirdly, uh, within FAO, uh, we have a lot of expertise, even in our division. For example, with the soils group in FAO, we work on uh, soil and agriculture. But you know that soil holds the potential also of soil moisture retention that can actually contribute in uh, helping us deal with water scarcity. My colleague Charity, who comes from Ghana, in the north of Ghana, when you use mukuna uh, to actually as a soil as a soil as a soil cover, it does help to protect uh, soil moisture and actually help you to increase your yield, not only by capturing uh, nitrogen, but also conserving the, 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 the humidity of your soils. Uh, I mentioned uh, water quality has emerged throughout this session as uh, a critical uh, dimension to follow. Within FAO, we have that expertise, but we do not link up sufficiently. Irrigation is key to what we do, because as, uh, I mean, uh, as the director mentioned also, this irrigation mapping is going to be very important because, yes, uh, we have uh, Aquastat, uh, which is really the world reference uh, uh, database on agriculture water management information. But uh, this uh, new initiative, as it was said, will focus on uh, supporting investments. So it will be targeted so that when you understand an area, its irrigation potential, and the specific crop, so that you can really do a cost-benefit analysis that ensures that uh, the water dimension of the investment through irrigation will maximize the benefits and also will ensure that uh, it is sustainable. So that's really the objective of OSAM and the other initiative that FAO is undertaking with regard to water scarcity. Thank you, Maher. Thanks very much, Jean. Actually, synergies, as you said, maintaining, and also actions with immediate impact through the groups. That's a very nice example you gave yesterday from the sustainable use of agriculture. The Italian chapter of WASAG could provide support to Cape Verde in terms of design of irrigation systems that is much needed, as we heard yesterday. Thanks again. Let me turn my face to you now, and then dialogue with you, audience all, but let me start with outsiders, partners. They're outsiders, but they are close to us. And I may pose one question general to all, then I'll pick up some partners to give us their views. So the question how, what you heard about the new approaches, the new water journey, reach a common goal that both parties of us targeting, in there what you see the areas that would match with your work, and last, what means can help us to get together there with a success, and it gives me a pleasure to invite Mr. Abdoulay, Abdoulay Mahamadou, the Executive Secretary of SILS, to deliver his views not only on FAO's work, but also on the forum itself. Mr. Mamadou.
Bonjour à tout le monde. Merci, monsieur le modérateur. Euh, Permettez-moi d'abord euh... merci. Permettez-moi d'abord de remercier le, les autorités du, du Cap Vert, en particulier le, le ministre de l'Agriculture et de l'Environnement, d'avoir bien voulu euh, adresser une invitation au SILS pour participer à, à cette importante rencontre. Je voudrais également féliciter le Cap Vert pour euh, l'organisation de cette deuxième session du Forum euh, sur la, la pénurie d'eau. Je salue le soutien important de la, de la FAO pour euh, l'organisation de, euh, de ce forum. Je crois qu'en en, en choisissant de de le co-organiser avec la FAO pour la deuxième fois. Euh, je crois que le, la FAO a vu juste parce que le Cap Vert est le pays sahélien le plus emblématique euh, concernant cette problématique de la pénurie euh, de l'eau. C'est vrai qu'elle ressemble beaucoup aux autres pays sahéliens, mais il a sa spécificité qui est également son, qui est son insularité. C'est un PC qui fait... Euh, sa différence avec les autres pays du, euh, du Sahel. Pour ceux qui ne connaissent pas le SILS, le SILS est le comité permanent inter-État d'élite contre la sécheresse dans le Sahel. Il fête cette année son cinquantenaire, donc il a 50 ans aujourd'hui. Euh, je voudrais dire que ça fait 50 ans que nous nous mobilisons autour des, des questions de lutte contre la désertification, contre la sécheresse, contre le changement climatique également contre l'insécurité alimentaire et nutritionnelle. Je disais tout à l'heure que le Cap Vert est le pays emblématique de cette problématique, mais nous avons vu hier, à travers les différentes présentations, qu'il y a aussi des, des solutions au Cap Vert qui se mettent en place, il y a aussi des, des innovations, il y a aussi des coalitions d'acteurs autour de la, de la gouvernance de l'eau. Je crois que c'est des signes encourageants, tout ce que nous avons vu euh, hier pour euh, vaincre l'adversité. La, nous sommes là à Sils, je ne suis pas seul, nous avons une, déléga, une, une importante délégation pour soutenir le Cap Vert, mais également pour dire que nous sommes là parce que c'est notre rôle, parce que le, le Cap Vert est membre du Sils, de voir ce qui se passe ici et de voir l'opportunité de mettre à l'échelle ce qui se passe ici, mais également de partager les expériences de, des autres pays. J'espère que pour le prochain forum, nous aurons des, des pays invités euh, euh, du, de la région pour également partager ces expériences, ces analyses autour de la question de la, de la précarité, euh, euh, de la pénurie de l'eau dans, euh, dans la région. Soyons clairs, la, la pénurie d'eau est le défi majeur pour les pays du, du Sahel. La maîtrise de l'eau est importante pour le développement agricole, pour le développement tout court de ces pays. C'est un facteur limitant pour les pays de la, de la région. Je viens du Sahel et tout à l'heure, les collègues de la FAO l'ont mentionné, il n'y a que trois mois de pluie et souvent, euh, on n'est pas sûr, avec beaucoup d'incertitudes. Donc, il est extrêmement difficile de faire du développement dans ces, dans ces situations-là. Nous sommes, je disais tout à l'heure que nous sommes venus pour soutenir le Cap Vert. Nous sommes également venus pour dire notre disponibilité à partager ou à, à s'associer pour euh, la suite de la mise en place de, de la construction de ces forums, parce que c'est un processus et je pense que le SILS peut jouer un rôle important auprès de, avec la FAO, le Cap Vert et d'autres pays sur la mise en place de, euh, de, ce, de, de cette coalition autour de la, de la maîtrise de, de l'eau. Alors, qu'est-ce que le SILS fait dans le domaine Nous avons deux dispositifs importants des dispositifs de prévention et de gestion des crises auxquels participe d'ailleurs la, la FAO, qui est un partenaire historique et important de, du SILS. Ces dispositifs qu'on appelle le PREJEC, il est plus connu par son nom 
le sigle Préjec. Nous avons d'ailleurs tenu l'année dernière une, une session de ce Préjec ici à, à Praia. C'est quatre fois dans l'année. Nous faisons le suivi du 1er janvier au 31 décembre de l'évolution de la situation agricole au Sahel et en Afrique de l'Ouest. Nous faisons également la situation de l'évolution du couvert végétal sur la région, en particulier les ressources pastorales, en particulier les écoulements de l'eau, parce qu'il euh, faut s'assurer qu'il y a de l'eau, parce que est... ce dispositif est associé à un autre qui est celui des prévisions saisonnières. Nous allons être, au mois d'avril faire les, les prévisions saisonnières pour la campagne 2023. Et ça, c'est des outils d'information pour les décideurs. Ça, ça nous aide à dire aux responsables des pays de la région que l'année 2023, voilà ce qui est prévu. Elle risque d'être pluvieuse ou moins pluvieuse et ça permet également aux pays d'élaborer de, euh, des plans de réponse face à la situation qui est projetée. Associé à ça, il y a ce que nous appelons le cadre harmonisé, auquel participe aussi la FAO qui assure la, la présidence, qui nous permet de, de collecter des données également sur la vulnérabilité au niveau de la région et dire aux États, voilà les, les zones à risque cette année, il faut faire attention, il faut déjà anticiper pour éviter des, des crises. J'ai écouté tout à l'heure notre collègue de la FAO permet de la, qui parlait de, de la collecte des de données. C'est très important, la collecte des données. Et aujourd'hui, euh, on a des grands problèmes dans les pays, parce que j'en ai parlé avec la directrice générale adjointe de la FAO à la COP15. On a un problème de capital humain de plus en plus dans nos pays. C'est que nous n'avons plus de gens capables de, de collecter les données. Il faut renforcer les capacités des pays à collecter les, les données. Le deuxième, justement... Le deuxième axe d'intervention du CIL, c'est le renforcement des capacités. C'est à la fois les formations diplômantes, mais également les formations pour, euh, sur courte durée, pour les, les techniciens, mais également les équipements. Quand je disais tout à l'heure, on fait de la, des prévisions pluviométriques, il faut bien qu'il y ait des stations hydrométriques dans tous les pays. Nous, nous, nous l'avons fait ici, nous le faisons ici au Cap Vert aussi. Nous avons d'ailleurs soutenu le Cap Vert dans le cadre du programme régional solaire, qui était un programme pionnier euh, il y a déjà une, une quinzaine d'années. Ensuite, nous avons également euh, des outils de formation, parce que nous avons des bases de données, en particulier hydrologiques et également agrométéorologiques, sur l'ensemble de, de la région, qui sont accessibles aux chercheurs, aux étudiants, comme euh, nous sommes à, à l'université ici. Je pense que c'est aussi un outil très important pour euh, les, les, les étudiants. Enfin, euh, notre quatrième axe d'intervention, c'est également euh, aider les communautés locales à, à mieux gérer euh, le stress hydrique, la résilience, à construire une résilience hydrique. Et à ce titre, nous coordonnons un certain nombre de, de projets au niveau de la région, euh, de surfinancement de la Banque mondiale et de la Banque euh, africaine de, de développement, pour développer des solutions d'irrigation, par exemple. Ça, c'est un axe important qui, qui pourrait être versé dans les prochains euh, forums euh, du, du, du OASAC, euh, parce que ça nous permet de comparer les, les solutions développées sur le continent, quelle est leur euh, opérationnalité dans le contexte, par exemple, du, euh, du Cap Vert. Donc, nous travaillons sur... Euh, sur ces questions-là, mais également la construction des barrages, des, des infrastructures, de retenir d'eau pour permettre aux populations euh, de rester sur place. On parlera tout à l'heure des, des migrations, dont l'une des de, 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 de causes est justement euh, l'absence de perspective. Quand il ne pleut pas, quand il n'a pas plu, euh, les villages ne peuvent pas, les, 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 les paysans ne peuvent pas rester parce qu'il n'y a pas, il y a pas d'eau, il n'y a pas de vie. Donc, euh, j'apprécie. Euh, hautement l'initiative de la FAO et les, ces, nouveaux, ces nouveaux objectifs avec ce, ce, cette feuille de route euh, très importante pour construire des dialogues, pour euh, également aboutir à, à mettre en place des politiques et des instruments et des stratégies pour faire face à la précarité euh, euh, et à la pénurie de l'eau. 
Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, M. Mamadou. Actually, the four areas of work you mentioned of SILS definitely matching what presented earlier by us and our way forward. From the UN agencies and partners, let me invite Mr. Robert Stefanski from WMO, a close partner to us, really to tell us what he heard and what can be, do, what can be done more together after what we heard. Please, Bob. Ah, there we go, thank you. Thank you, Maher and, and colleagues. Yes, the World Meteorological Organization and FAO have a long tradition. Um, we started our first MOU, I think, in 1952. And in fact, Dr. Lee and I just had a meeting last week on redoing the, the another five-year work plan MOU between our two organizations. So it's very fruitful. Specifically to the water issues, as some of you may know, you know, WMO it represents the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services of 193 countries around the world. So the hydrological data is very important, and we will work together uh, with FAO on this. Um, again, that's part of, I think, the MOU. We have, I think, five areas of cooperation. A and definitely with all the programs, um, sharing data is, is one of the major ones, and we talked about that last week during our, our bilateral discussions. Uh, and specifically, um, you know, Maher and I talk probably once a week on, on drought issues, so it's a very, very close collaboration. Um, we need to maybe work better on some of the water data. Uh, and I think for the UN agencies, our, our main uh, role is um, reaching out to the members and make sure they can do a better job providing services. Of course, FAO is to the agricultural sector. For WMO, it's allowing the National Meteorological Centers and, and services provide better, better weather and climate to agriculture. So again, we collaborate on ag meteorology, on drought, and of course, on water issues. Um, and so we have about four or five um, connections to FAO, and, and the Land and Water Division is one of the major ones. So we will continue that collaboration um, also in the context of WASAG, making sure that uh, enough, enough data is available as well and sharing data across all these different platforms. Um, and just to add, as we go farther into some of the, the water issues, this is the point of, of this talk, um, we do have something in WMO called the Water and Climate Coalition, and we do have what we call regional climate centers and we're trying to develop regional hydrological centers. So again, on the hydrological water sphere, um, we will be doing you know, more data collecting. And one of our roles with our services is better forecasting. So definitely on the weather scale, you know, one hour to one week. On the climate scale, one week to three months to a decade, and then on the climate change scales as well. But also at a seasonal level, um, especially we talked about SILS um, with the Agrimet Center. They are a WMO certified regional climate center. They do climate forecasts for the next three months and also do a hydrological forecast for all the river basins. So we definitely have a lot of work between us and we collaborate, uh, like I said, almost on a weekly basis. And that will continue. And just to plug a, a later event, you know, this afternoon, I think in room 201, We'll talk about how we're working on drought and what we've done in the past 10 years and then what we can do the next 10 years on drought policy with all the partners. And I just want to conclude, it is a partnership, I think, with FAO, uh, UNCCD, WMO, and many, many other partners. This is how we can help members um, do a better job providing services to their citizens. So I think the collaboration will continue and we have very specific areas of collaboration but it's welcome to work more on the water issues. And I'll go back to Geneva and talk to my hydrological colleagues as well and make sure we can strengthen those connections. So again, job well done. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, congratulate you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bob. Data, drought, continuously work, new ideas, regional centers for hydrology, climate change, 
very interesting. I think colleagues are picking them up. Let's hear the voice of IOM. And let me invite Ms. Hind Aisawi um, from IOM. Hind, how our work can curb down migration. Thank you very much, Maher. Can you hear me well? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, thank, thanks to, for, uh, for having IOM. Uh, that's the second uh, WASAC forum I'm uh, attending. And uh, I would just like to let you know that since 2019, thanks to this first invitation, we've been um, uh, collaborating and also progressing on the, for on the front of uh, human mobility, which encompasses uh, displacement and, uh, and migration, and human mobility in the context of climate change. So I would just like to, to thank you again and congratulate you because uh, this platform um, gives us the opportunity to discuss and also to build uh, a common narrative over human mobility, over migration in the context of uh, climate change, which of course, um, I mean, in which, of course, water is taking uh, an important place, should it be water scarcity, but extreme events um, and other related, uh, water-related events. So uh, we are, I mean, thanks to this, uh, this uh, f the first uh, WASAG forum, uh, we've, um, we've uh, met uh, the colleagues from the, the government of Senegal, uh, the government of Senegal, and uh, and uh, also we've, uh, we've um, uh, coordinated the, the, the action group on water and migration with the same partners, DWP, FAO, uh, and other partners, the Italian cooperation too. Um, we've, so we've collaborated for, uh, for three years preparing uh, the World Water Forum. Uh, and thanks to this collaboration, so we were in the core discussions of the World Water Forum. Uh, it's important to be in the core discussions uh, over agriculture, water, um, um, as uh, uh, th that human mobility is really part of, of, of the, the core discussions rather than side discussions. So, so I think it's a very important step. And then we've uh, collaborated to, to elaborate, uh, to formulate policy recommendations. Uh, on, the, on migration uh, um, and water in the context of climate change and also specifically in the context of rural development, which was uh, one of the pillars that were uh, um, prioritized by the, the government of Senegal. And then now we're working to elaborate key recommendations for the UN Water uh, Forum, but also for COP28. Um, so yeah, I mean, I maybe I might enter in the, into the details of these policy recommendations in the, in the technical session, but I just wanted to stress that collaboration uh, is extremely important, that also uh, building this common narrative can uh, uh, support us in having like open, an open mind re <laughs> regarding uh, migration. Uh, migration in the context of climate change and, uh, and, and water is not about um, 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 designing, developing solutions for people to stay, which are very important, but also solutions for people to move and solutions for people on the move. And it's extremely important also to consider migration um, uh, not as a problem to solve, but also as a reality that we need to all manage in a whole of uh, government uh, approach. So I will uh, enter much in more into details um, uh, the during the, the technical sessions, but I just would like to, I mean, I was inspired by the conversation we had with the colleagues of UNCCD this, <laughs> this morning and breakfast. I think that um, it's important that we design also together solutions that do not oppose the social and human rights of migrants. I mean, agriculture is also about migration because not only, I mean, uh, uh, the farmers uh, um, addressing the root causes of migration, but there are a lot of labor migrant, uh, migrants in agriculture, including in the region I cover, Western Central Africa. And I think it's important that we do uh, consider uh, the farmers as, I mean, uh, uh, important actors, um, uh, private sector actors, um, and also like employers of labor migrants, um, and, and that we do create solutions and design solutions that do not oppose the social and human rights 
of labor migrants and the environmental rights of the host communities. So thanks again for having me and uh, looking forward to uh, all the discussions we, we might have within the, the technical sessions and uh, uh, on the march of, uh, of, of, of the event. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, and indeed, migration is not only a problem to solve, but migration is a reality, the connection with agriculture, the farmers at the core of water and migration is a topic of interest for us. My colleague Patricia knows also more about that, worked previously on it. Let me invite research, and let me invite Mr. Peter McConnick from the Dirty Water for Food Institute. Peter. With the mic in hand, what is your advice to FAO? And do you see anything new to tell us and to connect with the Institute on your side? Hello? Yes. Thank you. Um, what do I see new? Well, what I see new and what I'm excited about is this doubling down on water within FAO, and that's, that's great to build on all the great tools and expertise you have, that's uh, really the leadership we, that I'm very encouraged to see. I'm from the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute at the University of Nebraska. Global, we are actually tasked to be engaged internationally, and one of the challenges of that being an institute based at a university is we really must have very strong partnerships and working partnerships, and FAO has been a very good partner in, in our journey. And, and certainly many of the partners in this room that came from, are from WASAG and have been involved in, in WASAG since the beginning have really been very effective partners for ourselves and, and for, for others in, in, in WASAG. As we were talking about this, I was reflecting on the original workshop where WASAG was conceived, and, and that was in Rome. I, I get confused between it. Was it 2016 or 17? I'm not, I, my, my memory isn't that good, but uh, there, interestingly, the, the most well-attended breakout session for a topic was drought. It, it was oversubscribed by the people in the room. There was lots of people interested. What always struck me as a drought was the sort of competing tools that everybody had. So man, everybody was developing a, a drought early warning system. I think, just for as an external observer, although Mark Svoboda from the National Drought Mitigation Center at Nebraska is, is on that working group, what has really happened there, I, I, I see that working group has made really fantastic progress. It, it's really been a, a helping to bring focus in, in, into the drought uh, uh, process, and I, I see that as very encouraging. One of the things that didn't make it up, uh, on, into the final movie from WASAG was water quality, and which was a, a, a significant annoyance to me because I see this as one of the major externalities of agriculture and water. And it's one that I worry about even more than the overdraft of groundwater. It's certainly one that I, I see that's really important. So I'm really pleased to see that emphasized in, in your list of, 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 of areas to, to work on. And I hadn't quite realized the internal implications within the FAO and working across those boundaries. So yes, we're very much supported on that. What I would like to make, and I, I feel that this is, you, you really are emphasizing many of the key areas. I would like to, the other thing in our institute is, in, in our mission, we impact is emphasized. And in the, in the United States, that's, we've got a, a very effective extension system in Nebraska. That's pretty straightforward how we go about impact. But in different contexts, it is very challenging. And I think as we hear about these information tools, the progress perhaps in the drought area, these things that you were mentioning, uh, WAPOR, and, and, and these tools, how do we get that into the hands of the decision makers and ultimately the farmers? Because I think that the information we have has to, it has to be, it has to change a management decision. And part of the issue, we tend to go to this case where we look at an app. Well, a farmer in Nebraska scolded me once. He pulled up his iPhone and he showed me his iPhone with 30 apps of all the different decisions he has to make around fertilizer, water, crops, irrigation, and everything. He said, give me one more app and I'll throw you off the farm. It's basically, how do you integrate this into the decision making of the farmer's reality? It's a really tough reality they have in terms of all those decisions. And the last thing they're worrying about or want to worry about is water. So how do we integrate that into the decision making? It may be an app at the farm level. It may be an app for extension service, information for NGOs. 
And I know FAO is very good at that. Uh, Eugene was talking about these examples in West Africa, but these are certainly the areas. How do we work on that? So we always, it's as we're on this journey to water, you know, where is the bus going? And, and, and basically it's, it's to, to the farmers really changing those uh, and creating those opportunities for those, those farmers. The other piece of that I think that's important is to continue to learn from what works and what doesn't work. And that's a contextual reality that we have to work on. So it's what are the principles we need to apply? What works drip? Is it these, is it these small uh, 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 buns or half moon systems in West Africa or, or elsewhere? Um, I, I think, again, that, that's uh, to come up with the principles that work and what doesn't work. And, and we, we're all familiar with them, but we tend to reinvent the wheel. And, and, and how, can we, how can we learn from our neighbors and our, from our, our neighboring countries? And they're put, putting, and again, I'm talking to the, the converted here in terms of farmers. This needs to be farmer-centric in terms of really understanding the realities of the farmers, and, and, the, and especially the women and the youth, so getting to the, the migration issue, the really creating intriguing or interesting jobs in the, in the value chain, on the farm and in the value chain for the youth, the women, and, and, and uh, improving the, the situation with migration, but also the local economy. Um, basically viable business models in, 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 in those contexts. Um, and finally, one of the reasons I was stressing farmer-centric, one of the issues I've struggled with over my career is how to be really constructive in the institutional piece. Because ultimately, in the rural areas, it's the rural communities, and particularly the farmers, that are the stewards of the land and stewards of the water resources. So how do we, how do we manage? We need to get the farmers involved in the discussion about how they manage the water resources. And that's at the farm, in the communities, but quite honestly, is get the farmers involved all the way to the UN. Because when I talk to farmers, they're pretty frustrated by this top-down top process. So that's my, my <laughs> key points at the moment. With that, again, congratulations. Thank you for your partnership and your support. And congratulations to Cape Verde on a very fant a fantastic event. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. I like the perception, decision-making, you put it at, on, on farmer side. We always keep decision-making at those who decide on top. So that's a very good point. Where the bus is going. Um, from CGR, how IMI would collaborate with FAO in this novel approach? May I ask Charity Osi Ampunsa to tell us a few words about that? I think I have to come up a bit. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Moderator. And let me use the opportunity to say congratulations to FAO and to WASA. So I think for us from UMI, we see FAO as the husband because we have had a very long uh, history of collaboration. So it's a relationship of marriage. You have the husband, we are the wife. And so we are very happy that we go on this new water journey with you. I think that we've collaborated a lot. For example, on the WAPO, we worked a lot with FAO. Also on uh, in irrigation infrastructure, we've done a lot of work. Working also with uh, capacity building on water user associations. There are so many areas that we've already collaborated in the old marriage, I should say. And so for now, for us, we, we are so excited. We want to travel with you on this new journey. We want to collaborate. We collaborate coming with a lot of skills. We have a lot of data sets. Uh, also, we have a lot of decision-making tools, both at the upper level, high level decision tools around issues of governance, policy making, like early warning, uh, early action, early finance decision tools. We also have a lot of tools around nature-based solutions, which I think it's something that we need to uh, focus on going forward. 
We have a lot of platforms set up at the regional levels. So IMI works globally in about 15 countries, but then within the regions, we have already set up policy dialogues. And this is something that uh, we can collaborate on and you can use such already existing platforms for the dialogues that you want to engage in in this new journey. So for us, I think that we are very, very ready. In fact, our luggage is packed. We are very uh, ready to go on this journey in terms of the collaboration. What uh, I would want to see more in this new journey is how do we ensure uh, coherence within the water issues, so water scarcity, but water scarcity is also linked to issues of land, issues of energy, issues of food, and at the policy level, most times these sectors, they are working in silos. But now as we move on this journey, how do we ensure that we bridge those gaps and there is proper coherence and we can really impact society. So we are ready, as I have said, we want to come along with you. We want to continue the strong collaboration, the strong marriage. We want to ensure that we bring on board transformative water solutions that will address water scarcity, but also all the other things that are linked to water scarcity. So once again, congratulations, and thank you so much for the opportunity to continue our collaboration with you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Charity. ICID is a professional organization or representing professional organizations. Um, let me invite Mr. Marco Acheri for a very quick, let's say, view on how ICID can contribute to this novel approach. Thank you, thank you, Maher, and uh, thank you, uh, FAO and uh, Director General Li Feng Li and Capo Verde for this excellently organized uh, workshop. This is our second workshop on uh, water scarcity. We were here from the very beginning. Actually, ICID is from the very beginning uh, in WASAG, as we are I'm proud to say, one of the founding institutions. Uh, there's many, many, many issues, many fields that ICID can contribute. Uh, first of all, uh, we have been established in 1951, and FAO was established in 1950, so we have a common path long, long in time. And we are based in uh, more than 100 uh, countries all over the world. We have national committees. And most of the officers uh, who belong to these the national committees are inside Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Water Resources, Environment. So one of the major contributions that ICID surely brings and can bring even in the future is to guarantee this advocacy level. Especially, this is very important, not at the only, not solely at the political level, but at the administrative level, because politicians, as you know, come and go. But if you have strong connections within the ministries, then you can guarantee your activities and you can guarantee this advocacy level. Second thing, uh, we have many working groups, mainly uh, WASAG is, I could say, and we have here the chair of WASAG, which is the former ICID president, Felix. ICID is exactly, has the same structure as WASAG. We have many working groups. So if I could express my personal opinion, I think that uh, one of the aspects, it, it was very interesting to follow the presentation of Dr. Li Feng Li. I think one of the aspects we sh should also be focusing on for the future is irrigation scheduling because there is a lot of water that is lost every day all over the world because farmers are not really uh, skilled or you know they just consider this like a secondary aspect. So this is one of the and again, one of the areas where ICID can greatly, I think, can greatly contribute. Third, and last but not least, is the uh, capacity building and training. We have, uh, I'm, I could say, uh, more than 5,000 uh, young professionals who are participating every year, sometimes twice a year, to our training workshops. We have working groups on this. Uh, run by uh, ICID officers. So again, this is not another area that uh, ICID can greatly contribute for uh, the milestones that uh, we, we are sharing together with, with FAO. 
Uh, let me conclude. Uh, we are in Capo Verde, we are in Africa with this, uh, probably most of you know this saying, uh, and this is the spirit that we are sharing along with FAO. Uh, in Africa, they say, if you want to go fast, you can go by yourself. But if you want to go far, you have to work together. So this is what we feel should be the spirit, and we're very proud, honored to be part of WASAC and to be collaborating with FAO as a direct uh, partner and f here now and for the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marco. Last but not least, actually, let me invite Ms. Mariette Cohen Verhoff to share how gender can contribute to the sustainability of the FAO's novel approach on water. Thank you very much. Um, I remember the first meeting we had in Rome when the idea of WASEC started and really, really pleased that, uh, that we got so far and that we, uh, we now are even contemplating the next step and uh, how to continue further. And not uh, in the least that uh, you manage to get water on the topic uh, list of, uh, of the FAO, because in the beginning that was not really the case yet. So, uh, so thank you for that. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, uh, this afternoon, uh, together with Peter and others, we're going to have a session also on how to implement um, uh, and, and reduced inequality, also inequality in the uh, in the in the agricultural sector, but in the in the full uh, water sector. I think that is important. I mean, there are many many women farmers, not only women smallholder farmers, but m women farmers that uh, specifically in Africa, 70 to 80 percent are women and uh, they have to be heard and they have uh, uh, to, uh, to know that uh, they, are, they are really thought of. Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Lo uh, uh, Li Feng talked about uh, implementing uh, policies and practices uh, in the next, um, uh, and, and cooperate with nas nations. I also think that it shouldn't only be national, it should trickle down uh, to the local areas as well, because uh, there is a, a gap between policies and practice, and uh, between practicing and preaching. So, uh, and this is not only in the agricultural world. This is this is everywhere. So, uh, and uh, really to achieve in uh, a change, uh, I think for the uh, the the, um, um, the women's side, and not only the women, also the youth. Um, it is very important to involve them, involve women and youth in action, in discussion. And uh, that includes the design, the decision making, uh, maybe uh, the, uh, the 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 financing of projects. Uh, we already talked yesterday about uh, the uh, um, the data. There are a lot of data, but are there, isn't it that we have to collect and an analyze sex disaggregated data? And isn't it time to use um, citizen um, science and citizens' data? I think national and local, I think that would be really good. Of course, uh, it was already said that um, uh, teach people, women, youth, indigenous people, and technicians to uh, multiple use and reuse of water. So there are a lot, and we'll continue uh, later. Uh, later this uh, after, actually, uh, I think it's after this uh, this session. Um, Organize vocational training, mentor these uh, these women and 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 the people who who, who work there. So uh, I think um, a gender balanced uh, organization uh, and a gender balanced event and meetings is one of the good starts. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mariette. Bit running late, but. Turning my face to you again for any burning question or comment to FAO's team on what you heard about the journey. 
I see a hand there, one there, and last there. Please. We start with the orange shirt there. Pinky or orange? Pinky. <laughs> oh, good morning. Uh, I'm going to speak in English uh, because I'm a Cape Verdean American and because I've been speaking in Portuguese and Creole for three months, but I'm not being heard. <clears throat> well, it's not really, well, a question that I want to ask, especially for a a FAO uh, and all the participants that have been here since uh, yesterday, is just at the end, why? I'm a little drop in the ocean. I'm very humble here to speak. I'm, I, I ask for forgiveness. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a gratonomy. I'm not a minister. I'm not a politician. I'm just a Cape Verdean that loves my country. I study in Arizona, and that's and during the pandemic, I was thinking, what could I do? And I was inspired for, from JFK. What can I do to my country instead of asking from it, okay? So I found out the newest, I believe, of one of the newest agriculture techniques in the world, which is called aeroponic. It has to do with everything I've been hearing here, every little subject. And I took the courage two years ago and I fought, it was a war, because nobody wanted to invest in it. But just to say, it's an agriculture that uses less 90 to 95% less water, uses 90% less soil. The crops grow three times faster. The energy level is so low, I have a little solar panel. I made a farm. I've been a farm for three months already, harvest four times. Before I came here this morning, I just went there, pick up vegetables, and I distributed. I just want to help, but I'm not seeing almost any interest from, I've been, I heard here yesterday collaboration, private and, and uh, institutional, I heard here at the university that here is knowledge. They have a agronomy major here. How can you don't teach the newest? And I invited everybody to go to the inauguration. The only public person that went was the American ambassador. All the ministries, all the mayors, everybody. And it's open to anybody. And the first place I went was FAO. Before I start, because I needed some finance, but they said they cannot help a private person. Then I went to the ministry, but I fought, I got it. So I invite you, this is the solution for water, soil, energy. My farm is at the coast. Yesterday I went to the Sanality, so you don't have to worry because it doesn't touch the, the soil. You can put it anywhere, can be urban or, or rural, anywhere here at this university, we can plant food that can, Cape Verde can all fit, and the most it's uh, approved by FDA, and USDA it has 35 to 60% more nutrition value than the ones on the ground. So I just ask why nobody wants to see it, I just wanted to know it. Thank you, I'm sorry I took too so much time, but believe me, I'm so frustrated and sad because I wanna help and people don't wanna be helped. I just wanna contribute if it can help FAO because it's so easy to do and less water. It's only, it only uses one to two gallons for 30, 36 plants. So thank you, I'm sorry. Thanks so much. I don't think you need to be frustrated. Um, I was told that, that uh, your invitation being accepted, and I think with pleasure the, the, the forum will be visiting your farm. 
during the field visit on Friday. So that's what I was told. <laughs> we can get another question and a very last one because we're running out of time. Please, lady there. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Maria Madiallo and I come from Belgium and I have Guinean uh, roots from Guinea Conakry. So I had a question uh, related to youth actually. So we know that young people are quite engaged and also vocal in the fight uh, against climate change. But I think there is a question we should reflect on. It's how to, how can we get the youth interested? Oh, so how can we get youth interested in agriculture? Uh, this was already mentioned, but I think the discussion should go further on how to promote youth, but also youth organization in engagement, but also employment in agricultural uh, value change. So I think that each of us, especially the different organizations, should have a strategy on how to ensure that young people have their place as agent of change, but also how they can get to see agriculture as a potential and attractive option. Thank you. Thanks so much, very interesting. We'll leave it for the final response. Last one. Uh, hi, my name is Vinny Nangia. I direct the Soil Water Agronomy Program at ICARDA. ICARDA is one of the CGIR centers specializing in dryland agriculture. I was very pleased to see the list of, of bullet points and, and the direction that FAO is planning to take. It sounds very aligned with the changing times and emerging issues. What I thought was missing was everything was tailored towards managing and improving efficiencies. So it was the demand side of things. It was not looking at the supply side. How can we increase the water supply? There's so much of emerging stuff happening with treated wastewater, desalination, uh, rainwater harvesting, fog harvesting, all kinds of stuff. Uh, that can also be incorporated. Maybe it's embedded somewhere, but it will be good to even look at the supply sides of things, especially coming from dryland agriculture. It really interests us a lot. Thank you. Thanks so much. In today's journey, my boss is reaching his terminal, Peter. So I would leave now, I would invite Mr. Liefingly to provide some responses to what is heard a bit of challenge and some concluding remarks, but also my colleagues can contribute. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mahara. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for your excellent uh, reflection and advice, you know, and the suggestions, you know, how we move ahead along the new FA water journey. And also certainly appreciate your questions uh, uh, and uh, on how to engage with the youth, how to look at the supply side uh, as, as well. And uh, even within WASAC, uh, in fact, we have a one vice chair. We have two vice chairs. One is really the representative from the youth. So we try to create this opportunity to engage with the youth. And certainly, it's a huge challenge. You know, I remembered when I was a small kid, one of the reasons I was you know, uh, studying very hard in the school is leave the village. Because I don't want to stay the village then to do the, exactly the same farming as my parents had been doing. But certainly, it's not easy for the young generations because, you know, uh, and once you go to education, then there's so many other, you know, different areas, and it is a challenging to, you know, increase, uh, to provide the opportunities, you know, to encourage the, the youth, you know, uh, develop their professional uh, in agriculture and in, in water. And uh, if we'll, I cannot remember the statistics, but there's a huge gap in terms of the need for young water professionals in continent like Africa. And then there's a huge gap if you look at how many you know, uh, students are majoring in agriculture or in water issues on this continent. There's a huge gap. So we will have to look at you know, um, how we as organization, how we as individual, how we as institutions Whenever it's possible and to create these opportunities to engage with the youth, to bring them on board. And since I joined my division, I always you know, try to find opportunities to you know, have the conversations, bring the youth team together, and then provide the opportunities for them to you know, grow their career and then have 
other you know, opportunities in terms of coaching, mentoring, and learning uh, so that they can grow up faster and they become much more you know, uh, matured professionals and hopefully you know, uh, leaders, thought leaders you know, in the future. Uh, and we do appreciate, we are open you know, to that question and we welcome you know, any, any you know, ideas that you know, we can help you to uh, you know, support uh, you know, uh, the youth to be, uh, to, to be involved in all these uh, dialogues and processes. Certainly on the demand side of the water, yes, uh, it's true. It's true in FAO, you know, if uh, you noted our strategic framework and uh, which is really advocate that we need agriculture sector, agri-food sector to be transformed into a more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food system in the future. Certainly we put lots of effort on efficiency uh, uh, because from natural resources perspective, we believe there's a huge space that we can do much, much better, as the gentleman mentioned, how we can use the pre you know, precious resources to really to improve efficiency. But certainly we will have to, as you said, we have to look at the supply side. That's one of the reasons that we will look at the irrigation needs and the potentials. That's also one of the reasons that we encourage countries to develop their national water plans or national water roadmaps, because that will address the big question regarding how water will be allocated in the future to meet the, the need of agriculture sector, but also the other sectors. And certainly the need for agriculture, we cannot compete with the need for drinking for example. Huh? So if you have the same amount of water as a decision maker, certainly you will first allocate that water to meet the social need. Yeah? So that's why we need to really look at the big picture and through a number of the initiatives that we can contribute to you know, ensure that a sustainable water allocation or sustainable water reallocation is happening from both the national level policy settings but also from the basin plannings, you know, from the municipality levels, to so connect all the water management levels that ensure that a sustainable water allocation will be achieved. So that will certainly address both the supply side, but also the demand side. I think we heard very, very good feedback from all of the partners. Thank you very much again. And uh, we are very excited you know, to start this journey and we really look forward to work with all of you so that we can really deliver impact on the ground uh, and uh, that's contribute to a smooth but also impactful FAO water journey. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I think we should give a hand to all the speakers and panelists. Again. Just before I make, uh, I'll make some household announcements. So we'll only reconvene here tomorrow afternoon for the closing session. Uh, as of now, we go on the other side where all the other meetings will take place. Uh, the one meeting where we're going to have a soft launch of the farmers' guidelines uh, is not going to take place. Uh, we will announce whether it takes place tomorrow. Uh, because there is room tomorrow. We, are, we have got one side event, uh, but we can have more. They will decide there's something that has happened that does not allow us to launch it uh, or to hold that uh, side event. Uh, I would like to introduce to you, I mentioned that the WASAC partners work in the spirit of WASAC. They work for free. You'll see the logo of FAO there. You'll see the logo of Climate Kick. You'll see the logo of IFAD, you'll see the logo of the World Bank, you'll see the logo of OECD. They have worked for a number of years to produce this uh, framework for unlocking finance for water and agriculture. Volume one, uh, I invite you to read it. It's uh, featured on our website. And then volume two will come with case studies, mostly by the World Bank, but also by IFAD uh, 
to demonstrate how we can easily access to finance in this uh, evolving world. Uh, the working group on salad and agriculture was to launch their publication. It might still happen tomorrow, the soft launch, but it's also volume one and volume two will be also on case studies. So you can see that gradually we are giving a, a meaning to our existence as WASAC partners. Uh, with that, I think I invite you for tea, and then let's aim to start at 11. I know that it's already 13 minutes. Uh, yesterday, those who were participating from Zoom uh, were a bit annoyed because we were late. So maybe we can give ourselves really a bit of discipline. We drink the tea quickly, and then we go to our rooms. Thank you. Uh, the post exhibition is tomorrow. Is it today? Now. So uh, on the program is tomorrow. Now. It's now. Yeah. If it's now, I'll just invite you to. It's on this side. Uh, in fact, you can go through there, but it's there permanently. Uh, you can go there now, and then throughout uh, tomorrow, you can still visit it. And then we'll put them also on our website so that you can visit those posters uh, after the forum. Thank you.